This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. To keep private certain facts that only the killer would know. Facts that might later prove valuable in an interrogation of a suspect. What the public was not told then were these details. The major knife wound was a gaping one from chest to umbilicus. Portions of the intestines had been left protruding from it, and several internal organs had been taken out of the body cavity and cut. Some body parts were missing. There were stab wounds to the victim's left breast, and inside those wounds the knife appeared to have been moved about somewhat. Animal feces had been found stuffed into the victim's mouth. There was also evidence that some of the woman's blood had been collected in a yogurt container and drunk. The local police were both horrified and mystified, and Russ Vorpagel was alarmed, too, because from what he knew of sexual homicide, it was clear to him, as it was immediately obvious to me, that we had to act quickly. There was a distinct danger that the killer of Terry Wallen would strike again. The high level of violence, reflected in the ghastly crime scene, made that almost a certainty. Such a killer would not be satisfied with one homicide. An entire string of killings might follow. I was due to go out to the West Coast to teach at one of our road schools on the following Monday, and we made arrangements that would allow me to arrive on the Friday before that, though on the same taxpayer nickel, and help Russ look into this crime. It was going to be the first time that I was able to go on site with a profile, and I looked forward to it. Russ and I were both so convinced of the likelihood of the Slayer striking again, however, that we shot back and forth a bunch of teletypes, and I did a preliminary profile of the probable offender. Criminal profiling was a relatively young science, or art, then, a way of deducing a description of an unknown criminal based on evaluating minute details of the crime scene, the victim, and other evidentiary factors. Here, in the original, and not entirely grammatical, notes written at the time, is how I profiled the probable perpetrator of this terrible crime. White male, aged 25 to 27 years, thin, undernourished appearance. Residence will be extremely slovenly and unkempt, and evidence of the crime will be found at the residence. History of mental illness, and will have been involved in use of drugs. Will be a loner who does not associate with either males or females, and will probably spend a great deal of time in his own home where he lives alone. Unemployed. Possibly receives some form of disability money. If residing with anyone, it would be with his parents. However, this is unlikely. No prior military record, high school or college dropout. Probably suffering from one or more forms of paranoid psychosis. I had plenty of reasons for making such a precise description of the probable offender. Though profiling was still in its infancy, we had reviewed enough cases of murder to know that sexual homicide, for that's the category into which this crime fit, even if there was no evidence of a sex act committed at the scene, is usually perpetrated by males, and is usually an intraracial crime, white against white or black against black. The greatest number of sexual killers are white males in their twenties and thirties. This simple fact allows us to eliminate whole segments of the population when first trying to determine what sort of person has perpetrated one of these heinous crimes. Since this was a white residential area, I felt even more certain that the Slayer was a white male. Now, I made a guess along a great division line that we in the Behavioral Sciences Unit were beginning to formulate. The distinction between killers who displayed a certain logic in what they had done, and those whose mental processes were, by ordinary standards, not apparently logical, organized versus disorganized criminals. Looking at the crime scene photographs and the police reports, it was apparent to me that this was not a crime committed by an organized killer who stalked his victims, was methodical in how he went about his crimes, and took care to avoid leaving clues to his own identity. No, from the appearance of the crime scene, it was obvious to me that we were dealing with a disorganized killer, 
a person who had a full-blown and serious mental illness. To become as crazy as the man who ripped up the body of Terry Wallen is not something that happens overnight.